My coach, who's um, my coach on my carnivore community, uh, her husband is carnivore at home, but then when she's not home, then maybe we'll eat some other foods. So anyway, he likes to buy lots of like foods. And so he bought these big bags of almonds and we're having these huge bags of almonds. Fast forward, he's getting these kidney stones passing painful, painful in the hospital because he's having so many almonds. Who would have thought? Kidney stones. You know, one of the biggest sources of kidney stones are potatoes. Really? Yeah, French fries and potato chips because they're very popular and you can get into a lifestyle with them starting at age 10 and be eating some form of potato product like that every day and get yourself into big trouble. A lot of my men who are kidney stone people are potato addicts. They love their potatoes. Wow. Okay, let's go into the 30 bad foods. Well, higher oxalate foods and some easy swaps. So you mentioned the potatoes. So that comes under starches and tubers. Um, why are those bad and what should we eat instead? Well, um, if you depending if you're using them kind of like mashed potato, that's easy to replace with cauliflower and turnips and rutabaga. And I have some recipes on my website and in my cookbook on my website for that. Um, if you're trying to make French fries and stuff, you can make crunchy foods. Personally, I think the equivalent is crunchy bacon because it's outside's crunchy and the inside's all greasy and it's salty and it has that whole experience of the french fry except for the starch melting in your mouth so a piece of bacon <laughs> might satisfy that and there are other kind of chippy kind of things you can do um depends on what you're looking for if you're looking for crunch salt fat starch, it depends on what you're trying to do with it but from a place say you're putting together a thanksgiving meal or something that's kind of classic and you want that mashed vegetable there's plenty of white vegetables and pale yellow vegetables that make a beautiful mash if you know how to not have them be as watery. So the difference between potatoes is much starchier than those non-starchy vegetables. So you have to kind of dry them out more. So you can either do set them back in the pan and let them kind of work off their extra steam or setting them in the oven and kind of give them a slight drying process so that you have an, not so much water so they don't collapse. If you want that nice, fluffy mashed potato consistency, there's just a few techniques like that. Using plenty of salt, lots of butter, and you can even fancy it up with a little cream cheese or cottage cheese or something um, to get that nice, rich mashed potato flavor. Baked potatoes, you know, you can you can create other things that hold whatever it is you're putting on that baked potato that you really want it for. Uh, you can use cheeses to do that. You can use it, it, a little creativity in the kitchen and you can swap it out. Okay, so that was category number one, starches and tubers. So sweet potatoes, white potatoes, yucca or cassava. I don't think many people have that. Well, everyone knows somebody who's either celiac or gluten-free for some other reason. And they're, they're using things like almond flour, cassava flour. They're using things like quinoa, buckwheat. All these non-gluten foods are quite high in oxalate. Okay. Well, that was part of my other list. Where's my category? Let me just go back to my categories. Okay. So the first one was starches and tubers, as you mentioned. So the next one is leafy greens. So we mentioned that at the beginning, but spinach is one, beet greens is another, and Swiss chard. Yeah. Chard and beet greens are technically the same vegetable. It's just that the chard doesn't know how to make the beet, but, and they're both worse than spinach. They are the worst. <laughs> really? Yeah. They're a little bit worse than spinach and uh, sorrel is up there and rhubarb is up there in this category. And that's it. I mean, that's it for leafy greens. It's really just sorrel, which no one eats. Charred beet greens are just kind of the same thing. And spinach, that's all the other leafy greens are fine. What to eat instead? What to eat instead? So you and all the lettuces, um, watercress, arugula, the little mini Asian greens, all of them are real low. Romaine lettuce, practically nothing. Okay, so I've got here arugula, romaine, mustard greens, collard greens, bok choy, kale. Okay, next category is nuts and seeds. So we mentioned the almonds. What are other nuts on the list that we shouldn't have? Cashews, peanuts, and then the others are get kind of a little less worse, but things like most of the nuts, you, like small amounts of walnuts are okay. Small amounts of macadamia nuts are okay. As long as your gut can handle the seediness of them. I really think seeds are designed to be indigestible. They're supposed to be consumed and pooped out according to the tree that made them or the plant that made them. They're really not interested in being digestible. So 
if you have any inflammation issues or digestive issues or immune issues, I think they're trouble generally. Even the low oxalate seeds like pumpkin seeds are great. You want to sprout them, have them salted. They're versatile. You can turn them into a butter and replace peanut butter with a, with a pumpkin seed butter. But if you're having health problems, you want to be cautious about seeds and nuts because I think they're hard to digest, even sprouted, even properly prepared. Mm -hmm. So I have here as alternatives, just having butter would would be like a nice fat. Yes, like free some butter. It's good. Have you tried brown butter bites? I have not, but I can imagine how they're done and that they would be great. They kind of like Carmel. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so um, another solution would be, would be coconut flakes. Maybe that might be a better option. Yes. And coconut flakes can cook up into like little cookie things. You know, I, I've got a recipe in my cookbook, how you kind of glue them together and you can sweeten them and turn them into a cookie that others could eat that has no gluten, no eggs, no dairy. And it's really great for the sort of sensitive people who are on these elimination, whether a carnivore or not. Like there are cheat days for carnivores that the coconut might be the place to go for that. <laughs> oh, day. don't say cheat days to carnivores because they might think, oh my God, no, we have to be strict. Occasionally you have family events or you have holidays or whatever, and you try to blend just a tiny bit. Well, you know, if you want to cheat on carnivore, do keto. That's always a better option than standard American diet. A lot of these keto foods are high oxalate. So if you're going to do a carnivore, if you're going to do a keto diet, Really, that's how you end up carnivore because so many of the low carb plant foods are high in oxalate and have other problems. And it just can be not getting where you want to be because you're trying to optimize your health. So the goal is to get results, not just to follow some rule book. Absolutely. Um, next category is fruits. So what are the worst high oxalate fruits to avoid? Kiwi, uh, star fruit, thank God. Westerners don't eat it, but in other countries, it's a it's a superfood like spinach, star fruit, and star fruit juice. They're the bad ones, and um, like the citrus peel that you make. What do you call it? Fruit cake in like Christmas time. The fruit cake that stuff is loaded with oxalate. The, the good thing about the fruits is the fruits tend to make crystals in this not as much soluble oxalic acid. So the fruit, if you eat it whole and don't purify it into like a juice or a smoothie, if you don't beat it up, the vacuoles and stuff can kind of sort of protect you a little bit from the crystals and you're not, there's not as much oxalic acid in them to absorb. So again, with the numbers, some of the fruits that are high oxalate, you can get away with it some, but generally it's the blackberries, raspberries, kiwi, kiwi, just stay away from it and, and star fruit. Now, as Sally mentioned, some common foods like fruit and kiwis are very high in oxalates. And I'll actually link Sally's book down in the description so that you have an easy reference of the foods that are high in oxalates and some very easy swaps. But quite interestingly, it is not just high oxalate foods that can cause disease. Chemicals in our skincare, such as parabens and phthalates, have actually been linked to disease. They can actually disrupt hormones and even cause insulin resistance. Because whatever you put on your skin can penetrate what's called the blood-brain barrier and that can get into our cells, potentially causing long-term issues. When I found out about this, it completely changed my life. Because as you know, I have followed a high-fat carnival lifestyle for the past few years, and it's helped me heal so many different chronic health issues. But I still didn't realize I was exposing my skin to toxins through my everyday skincare. And I used to use 10 different skincare products, but now I only use one. It's 100% grass-fed, chemical-free tallow balm. Now you might be thinking, Rena, why would you put tallow on your skin? Well, this has helped my skin so much. It's improved the hydration, my skin texture, and even the moisturization. So I generally have very sensitive acne prone skin. And that is why I created the Primal Tallow Balms as a chemical free solution for my skin, but also for your skin. The Primal Tallow Balms contain 100% grass fed, grass finished tallow that naturally contains vitamins A, D, E, and K2. So what does that mean for you? Well, you could experience better skin texture, better hydration, and even better moisturization. And the best thing, there's no preservatives, there's no nasties, it is just pure tallow. And I love to use this unscented balm every single day. Just one dollop lasts me 24 hours. So if you want to be chemical free from the inside out, pick up a tallow balm. Just head to shop.theprimal.com and get 10% off your next order. Okay, so getting back to fruits, what to eat instead. So blueberries, I've got here, pears, apricots, Maybe just like don't eat fruits that whole that often because you can get nutrient density from animal products. But let's move on to the next uh, few categories. So grains and flowers. So 
buckwheat and quinoa you mentioned. Not good. What to have instead? White rice? Is that true? Yeah, it's true. There's very few grains that are like really reliably low oxalate and they're variable. There's a lot of different species of say corn and wheat and so on and different processing methods. And, and see, uh, the other thing that makes oxalate is, is mold. And if your grain hasn't been properly handled, if it was harvested when wet, left in the field, stored wrong, stored too long, there could be molds growing in them. And there's one mold, aspergillus, that will produce oxalate. So, so the amount of oxalate in wheat flour can vary because of species and because of handling. So it's hard to know like how much of this flour is okay. Whereas with rice, rice just generally isn't going to accumulate or make that much oxalate and white rice in particular, because the, the oxalate tends to be in the bran, which is the outer layer of the grain. Remember I was saying like seeds, which grains are seeds, use oxalic acid and oxalic crystals to give a firm coat that helps them stay dormant and protects them for, for lasting as a dormant seed. So when you remove the bran, you remove a huge amount of the oxalate and other toxins in plants. Okay. That's not to say that people should eat white rice. Maybe if you're somehow having it, it's a better option than, for example, quinoa, because quinoa is touted as, oh my God, there's health food, but it's really not healthy. So the next one is quite interesting um, around drinks. So black tea is really not good for you. Well, we use it all the time to try to, to moderate, like going too low in oxalate can cause some issues. So we use it all the time for people who tolerate it. But it's it's got a lot of things in it, like tea extracts and they turn them into supplements are known to be toxic. Like there's tannins are toxic and other compounds are toxic and then it has oxalate too. But decaf um, tea has less oxalate in it by a little bit and all the herbal teas have almost no oxalate in them. There's very few herbal teas that have oxalate. So if you like a nice hot drink, you can do it with lots of substances if you're interested in that. So what about bone broth or even a melted butter drink instead? Is that a better option than tea? Yeah, it probably depends on the person, but yes, in moderation, you know, I wouldn't do more than two cups of bone broth a day, depending on how rich it is with gelatin, because it's the gelatin amino acids, the hydroxyproline principally, that can become oxalate in the body, and you literally can overload. If you're eating more than about a tablespoon of gelatin, which you know, when you're making jello, that that gelato, that will turn two cups of liquid into jello. So if you're doing more than two cups of a broth that's so rich that it turns to jello in your refrigerator, then two cups is enough. More probably, if you're doing it every day, eventually bordering on too much. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, we mentioned the dark chocolate. So under the category of snacks, treats, and sweeteners, um, dates as well are no good. Maybe have some figs instead. Is that right? Oh, that's backwards. Figs is bad. Have dates instead. Yes. <laughs> That's a great one to mess up because um, WebMD or some big website has that mixed up and it's calling dates high. And so I wrote a whole blog post about that. So check out my blog on my website. I talk about dates and the confusion about dates and figs and all that. That's a perfect mistake. Thank you. I couldn't have planted a better one. <laughs> Well, next one is vegetables. So we mentioned, so okra, rhubarb, celery, and carrots, high oxalate. Pretty high. I mean, celery and carrots are kind of moderately high. So a little bit here and there, a little bit in the soup or the broth or whatever is not going to kill anybody. But you don't want to start living on carrot juice and celery juice. It just concentrates it. And like we said, the juicing process makes what oxalate is there more bioavailable, therefore more toxic. Okay. What to eat instead? Zucchini, cucumber, cranberries, tunip, fennel, iceberg lettuce. What do you think? Yeah. Um, I don't know why fennel is on the list because fennel is one of those medium ones like celery. Okay. Take carrot. them off then. That's fine. I'm asking the oxalate queen here. So, you know, I've got my list, but you tell me. <laughs> yeah, it's very, and so there's a, most of the lists online are just not right. And the list in the textbooks, the nursing textbook, one of the nursing textbooks that I looked at in the library, the medical library, had like 36 items on the list and nine of them were wrong. These were, they said, these are the high oxalate foods and nine of them were low oxalate foods. That's in a nursing textbook. And that data came from the American Dietetics Association. This is coming from the official profession of nutrition is putting out bad data. Okay, let's get through to the last two categories. So this one for sure, legumes. Beans are not good. They are not. They, they are starvation foods for sure. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I feel sorry for somebody that loves to eat. Like my mom loves to have lentils, but lentils is, is lentils part of it? They're not high in oxalate, but they're very high in lectins. So you need to do the classic, like in India, they know to use pressure cooking and turn it into this dal that's real thin and because they've cooked them to death. And that's what you need to do to deal with lectins. Most people in India use pressure cookers. It was out of fashion until recently here. Now people have more pressure cooker options. But you, the research says that these beans and seeds should be soaked for three to four days to be sure you break dormancy and then pressure cook them to make them safe in terms of lectins. Nobody's soaking their beans for three to four days. That just isn't happening. So yeah, beans are a compromise. They're they're storable. They're lightweight. You can put them on a chuck wagon and go conquer the wild west. You can do stuff with them. They're they're practical. They're cute. They're not nutritionally optimal. Nope. Okay. So I've got here soybeans that uh, we shouldn't have. Navy beans, black beans, what to have instead. So you mentioned lentils are okay, but you have to cook them in a way that avoids the lectins. Black eyed peas and lima beans. Yeah. The lima beans. And then there's, um, what's another one? Chickpeas aren't too bad. The peas generally. So green peas, chickpeas, and black eyed peas are much lower than the beans. And the worst beans are the white and black. The white ones is what we make like sort of Boston baked beans with, your standard summer baked beans. So we're talking in the summer and you can get yourself in bean salad and then the the baked beans and start adding in potato salad. Like summer is a time when people surprisingly are getting a lot of oxalate and then comes the fall, we have chocolate and almonds. <laughs> it's oxalate all year round. Yeah, you can switch your oxalate horse every season. Okay, last category is superfood powders and spices. So turmeric and cumin. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think spices, if you're sick, they, you know how we put black pepper in with turmeric in order to force the body and the liver to not be capable of protecting itself from turmeric and not absorbing it because the body doesn't want to absorb curcumin. And so we add black pepper to force it. That's, I think, loading spices up will force the toxicity of foods generally. And so I think there's not only there's a lot of oxalates in black pepper and cumin and turmeric and so on, and a lot of spices that are in Indian food, th that combination of the oxalate plus the other substances in there is kind of toxic. And if you're sick, you really got to carve back this really high spicy, high oxalate spices. If you go to like white pepper, rosemary, if you know a few herbs and salt and pepper, you can do a lot culinarily and you can really save yourself some stress and problems. Thanks so much for watching that clip. If you want to see the full episode, just click here. There's also a link in the show notes and don't forget to subscribe for more clips just like this one.